Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to talk about times of testing today. It's always a popular subject because everybody has times of testing and everybody's hoping that, you know, the Lord is going to speak to them and encourage them in their time of trial. Well, we're going to look at Numbers 20. Numbers. Numbers 20. Did I say something else? (laughs) Numbers 20. And I'm going to read from verse... 2 to 13 and just while you're looking for it the children of Israel have come out of Egypt and they've been wandering around the desert for 40 years okay that's about where we are in the biblical sort of story numbers 20 2 to 13 kind of follows on a little bit from what I spoke about last time okay numbers 20 2 to 13. So here we go. So the children of Israel are in the wilderness and they're thirsty again. Verse 2 says, Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we died when our brothers fell before fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community out into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he had commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Aaron and Moses, Because you did not trust me enough to honour me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarrelled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. So basically what happens, God says to Moses, speak to the rock. Forty years ago, he told him to go up to the rock and strike it with his staff, which Moses did. Um, But this time, 40 years later, um, he says, go and speak to the rock. But Moses is so frustrated with the people, he strikes it again. And God says, because because you disobeyed me, you won't go into the promised land now. Okay, so that's kind of the the background to the, the incident. This incident happened at Meribah in Kadesh Barnea. Um... Moses is angry, strikes the rock, God punishes him. And there are two incidents that happen in places called Meribah. The first one that I mentioned, that was called Meribah as well. And this one, where he should have spoken to the rock, they call this place Meribah as well, because it means quarrelling with the Lord, which is what the people did. Now, the last time I was here, I spoke about the first incident. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, Very similar to this in Exodus 17. Uh, Moses strikes the rock and water's provided. And we spoke about this being a picture of Christ being struck, Christ being hung on the cross and crucified, um, and then living water is provided. But the passage we just read is the second incident, about 40 years later, where water again comes out of the rock. Um, But this one symbolises that now Christ has died, he was struck once, All Moses should have needed to do now is to speak to the rock uh, and water would have come out. So Christ is struck once and after that, all we need to do is go and speak to him in prayer and we receive the living water, the blessings. And so that's kind of my opinion of what, what those two incidents mean. Christ is struck once. He doesn't need to be struck again. He doesn't need to die again to provide for us. All we have to do once he's originally been crucified is to speak to the rock, to pray, and and God will hear. And God is a bit annoyed about this, I think, because 
Moses spoils this little picture that God is setting up. You know, he would have liked it, I would imagine, to Moses to have spoken to the rock. And, you know, in our Bible studies, we could have talked about, oh, all you need to do now is speak to the rock. But Moses spoils that. So that's why I think God is annoyed with him and says, you can't go into the promised land now because you disobeyed me and you spoiled my picture. So that's the sort of the background to it. They're both places where God tested the people to see what their faith and obedience would be like. They were thirsty on both occasions, uh, and God says, you know, strike the rock, speak to the rock. Are they going to trust me to provide for them? And we know that the people were grumbling and moaning because they weren't happy with the situation. Sure I'm on the right page. Yep. (laughs) Um, Both of these events were times of testing, for the Israelite people. There was a lack. They didn't have enough water to drink, and so they became angry with Moses and Aaron. And they say things like, why didn't you let us die in the wilderness? Now, we spoke before about, you know, when you're frustrated and things aren't going right, be careful what you say. Don't curse God or speak negatively. We've had a few sermons on that. Still grumbling, complaining about the situation they were in even though God has been faithful in the past. He's delivered them from Egypt. He's parted the Red Sea. He drowned the Egyptian. He provided water, manna. He provided meat and quail. But they forget all that and they start arguing with Moses, complaining about him again, which is why it's called Meribah. Complaining that their situation isn't what they want it to be. Do you know, we can so easily do that, can't we? We can so easily complain to the Lord or to the people around us that our situation isn't what we want it to be. This isn't the way I want it to go, Lord. Why didn't you do it some other way, a better way? That's what they're really saying. We don't like what you're doing, Lord. And we can do that as well. And when we sort of moan, even in prayer, we can moan spiritually in prayer, can't we? Um, what we're really saying is we want, a, we want an easier way. We want you to do it a different way, Lord, because we don't actually like what you're doing. And we don't want to have to stand in faith um, when things get difficult. It's kind of what we're saying. We don't want to have to trust God in a situation that he could so easily change. He could speak the word, snap his fingers. The whole situation could change, but he doesn't do that. He's testing us. He's trying us. What are they going to do when things get tough? Are they going to trust me? What happened here? Well, it caused trouble and stress, didn't it, their lack of water? It stressed Moses out, so he sinned by striking the rock when he should have just spoken to it. And that's the danger with grumbling and complaining or quarreling with God. It's evidence of an attitude problem, isn't it? And we've all got it, we all do it. At the moment, I'm waiting for my house to sell, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and the Lord's saying, just trust me. But I don't like it. I, I want to move, you know, I wanted to move weeks ago. It didn't happen. And I was praying, I said, right, Lord, I, I just want you, I'm just telling you, Lord, uh, I just want to make you aware of how important this is to me, that I move by this time, and my sister can come over. I just want you to know how important those things are to me, Lord. You know, just thought I'd make it clear to him. But Lord, let your will be done. Grumbling and complaining. It's a bit of evidence of an attitude problem that we're not prepared to wait. We're not prepared to trust him. We're not prepared to suffer. And the scripture says that it's by suffering that we're made perfect. That's a scary scripture, isn't it? Christ was made perfect through suffering. And so it follows that we will too. Although the people obviously need water, they have other complaints about Moses. Verse 5 says, they say to him, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. They sound pretty generally pretty discontented, don't they, with their situation. Do you know, discontentment is a very dangerous attitude to have. Um, particularly when we're a people who have dealings with the Lord. We stand before the Lord. 
Dis discontentment is dangerous because it causes us to speak negatively, to be, um, to grumble about the Lord's work and what he's doing in our lives. In times of testing, we need to be very careful not to become discontented uh, or get angry or resentful about the situation, which is human nature to do, because we all want to move on and things to change. Israel, interestingly, have several gripes uh, that we read in verse 5. First of all, they're talking about, this is a terrible place. That's what they say. There's no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates. They're comparing their life now with their life back in Egypt. And basically saying, oh, it was, it was better in Egypt. But they were slaves in Egypt. They had taskmasters over them. But because of their lack now, they've forgotten all that. They just remember the grain, the figs, the, um, the grapevine and the pomegranates. That's what they really want. They grumble about what God has done for them. They're not happy despite all the incredible miracles he's done for them when he brought them out of Egypt. This is a terrible place, they say. We want the benefits of being in Egypt. We want the food. And you know, sometimes the will of God to us seems like a terrible place. This is so hard, Lord. What are you doing to me? What are you doing in my life? I don't like it. It's hard. It's painful. It hurts. My patience is being stretched. My long-suffering is being stretched. It's a terrible place. But you know what? We have to be careful because it's actually the will of God. It's the will of God. A time of testing is often the will of God, and we never like it. But we have to be careful how we respond to it. God expects us to be submissive, willing, and obedient. That's what he expects. He's given us the word. To, he's given us the Holy Spirit. He expects us to be submissive in times of trials. He expects us to act in faith and trust him and not to cry out, Lord, this is a terrible place. Why have you brought me to this place? That's not what he wants. That caught, you can see what happened in the scriptures when they did that. It caused Moses to be angry and he makes a very big mistake, strikes the rock instead of speaking to it. And his punishment is that he's not going to go in and see the promised land. What a, what a, what a, what a big mistake. What consequences for just losing his temper over the frustration of the situation. We shouldn't be saying this is a terrible place because it's the will of God for us. And however difficult our lives are, we are still in Christ. And being in Christ can never be a terrible place. Being in Egypt, being unsaved with the threat of hellfire hanging over us perhaps and the wrath of God... That's a terrible place. But being in Christ, in the will of God, can never be a terrible place. Like the people of Israel cried out. He has redeemed us, giving his own life to save us. We're no longer in darkness. We no longer have an eternity separated from God. We can never be in a terrible place. We are blessed in Christ. We're seated in heavenly places. That's where we are. We're not in a terrible place. The will of God can never be a terrible place for you. There was a poem that uh, came to mind when I was talking about this, and it says, The will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. I don't know if you've heard of that poem. Uh, we don't know who the author is, but Billy Graham quoted it once or twice, so I think that's where that, those particular two lines come from. I'm going to read the poem out to you because it's very good. It's about the will of God. It starts off by saying, The will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you, where the arms of God cannot support you, where the riches of God cannot supply your needs, where the power of God cannot endow you. The next verse. The will of God will never take you where the Spirit of God cannot work through you, where the wisdom of God 
cannot teach you, where the army of God cannot protect you, where the hands of God cannot mould you. The will of God will never take you, where the love of God cannot enfold you, where the mercies of God cannot sustain you, where the peace of God cannot calm your fears, where the authority of God cannot overrule for you. And the last verse, the will of God will never take you, where the comfort of God cannot dry your tears, where the word of God cannot feed you, where the miracles of God cannot be done for you, where the omnipresence of God cannot find you. The will of God is a safe place to be. It's not a terrible place, like the children of Israel cried out. They were in the will of God. They were following Moses, who spoke face to face with God. And yet they were still able to cry out, this is a terrible place. There's no pomegranates here. You know, their earthly nature took over. They wanted the food. And if you look at that, verse 5, they actually mention the food before they mention the water. There's no grapes, there's no pomegranates, there's no grain or crops. Oh, and there's no water either. That's what they were missing. Their carnal nature was in the uppermost. And unfortunately, it came out of their mouths. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what the scripture says. So we need to make sure we're not grumbling and complaining about the will of God in our lives. Because although it might be hard, God is there with us. It reminded me of the three Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. I used to teach uh, that in Sunday school, and I'm sure you all know the the song, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. I'm not going to sing it now, but it's a good one, isn't it? The book of Daniel, thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Was it a terrible place? Were they on the floor being singed and burnt and tormented? No, they weren't. Anybody looking at it or just hearing the story would have thought, what a terrible place to be in the middle of a furnace, burnt to a crisp. No, it was the will of God, that was why. And there was the fourth man in there with him. Although they were in a time of testing in the middle of the furnace, God was there with them. The fourth man that looked like the son of God, as uh, the people who were looking said. What happened to the three Hebrew men? They came out unscathed, and they didn't even have the smell of burning on their clothes. Not affected by this terrible time of trial at all. They came out unscathed, and God got the glory. Amen? There's another script situation in Scripture where Israel actually behaved correctly this time. They got it right. It's always good to look at a situation where Israel got it right. It was a time of trial, and it all went well for them because they did the right thing. And this was in 2 Chronicles 20. Um, Jehoshaphat is king of Judah, um, and a vast army comes against him. I'm sure we know the story. Jehoshaphat prays, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us, Lord. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's what Jehoshaphat prays. And Jehoshaphat is directed to march out against the army. And as they marched out, verse 22 says, As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the enemy who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. So the Lord worked for them. Why? Because the children of Israel, Jehoshaphat, led the people out singing praises to the Lord. And there was quite a walk. I did a study on it once. I think I can't remember how long it would have taken them, but a good few hours to get to the place where uh, the, uh, the enemy was. And they sang and praised God all of that way. With all their armour on, up hills, down hills, they praised the Lord. Here we see the right way to behave in a time of trial. We stand in faith against the enemy and we sing praises to him. And God works on our behalf. It's not effort on our behalf. We sing praises to the Lord, and he's the one that does the work. Amen. Amen. I was thinking about a person who hadn't been to our church for a while, 
they have some problems, you know. And um, I've been sort of saying, Les has been saying, and I've been saying, we must try and ring this person to encourage them and keep them going, make sure that they know they're cared for and that we're interested in them, even if they haven't been for a while, through their difficulties. And I was just in the bathroom getting ready this morning, and I thought, actually, do you know what, Lord? I'm going to hand this over to you. I'm going to let you do the work to bring this person back. Instead of me thinking, I've got to ring this person, I've got to keep texting them so that, so that I keep encouraging them. I thought, no, I'm going to let you do it, Lord. So I'm praying that God will intervene and bring this person back instead of me doing all the work. Let's let the Lord do it. He has better ways of doing it. So be careful in times of trial. Don't behave like Israel did in the wilderness, grumbling and complaining, desiring things from the past that are often not you know, what we need at the moment, desiring things we can't have, desiring things from the future that aren't ours yet, looking back and mourning the loss of things that are in the past, the grain, the figs, the grapevines, the pomegranates. That's what Israel did. We mustn't be discontented with our situation and start calling it, oh, this is terrible, Lord, what are you doing to me? This is a terrible place. Because we've said the will of God can never be a terrible place. We're in Christ. We're blessed. We're kept. You know, I heard a, a saying a long time ago, so I think someone preached it, that everyone lives in one of two tents, as in little tents, you know. You're either in the tent of contentment or you're in the tent of discontentment. Which tent are you in? And people, it, was, it must have been a sermon that someone preached at church because every now and then, even like 20 years down the line, someone will pipe, pipe up and say, oh, which tent are you in? You know, and immediately we know what they mean because we all heard the sermon. Which tent do you live in? Are you in the tent of discontentment or are you in the tent of contentment? Don't live in the tent of discontentment. Let's follow Jehoshaphat's example. He talks to God very honestly. He says, I don't know what to do in this situation. And quite frankly, Lord, I haven't got any power to resolve it and sort it out anyway. But you know what to do. Handing it over to him. And then he responds to the instruction that the Lord gives him. The Lord says, you won't have to fight. March out against them. And he does that, singing and praising the Lord. Marches out courageously against the enemy where the Lord meets him. And somehow the enemy is scattered, defeated, melts away into nothing. And when we've actually managed to, you know, hand our situation over to the Lord and really let go of it, not just for a little while, really let go of it, then the Lord can intervene and he changes the situation permanently. Amen? Praise the Lord. So I hope that's encouraging. Don't live in the tent of discontentment and don't start saying the will of God is a terrible place because we're blessed in Christ. Amen? Praise the Lord.